You might think that the horrific suicide of Richard Bilkstow, a 24-year veteran Toronto principal and teacher after being publicly bullied and shamed by a racist diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant in front of his peers would lead the woke, self-flagellating, and nation-hating advocates of this ideology to pause and perhaps reconsider their efforts to label everyone and everything an agent of white supremacy in perhaps the least racist country on earth. But you'd be wrong. It appears as though the death of Richard Bilkstow has only emboldened the DEI industry in this country and, as to be expected, strengthened their resolve to continue their culture of making Maoist struggle sessions a compulsory element of training for everyone everywhere. Would you be surprised to learn that politicians and activists are now rallying to the defense of Kike Ojo Thompson? Painting this rich black woman who berated Bilkstow as the real victim in this story? Last week, the audio of the interactions between Kike Ojo Thompson and Richard Bilkstow during these DEI training sessions back in 2021 was released by the journalists over at the Free Press. And let me tell you, the audio of these interactions is just as vile and gross as you're likely expecting it to be. A woman who's made a career out of telling white people that they're not anti-racist enough is heard telling this room of Toronto principles that Canada is a more racist country than the United States and that Canada is a bastion of white supremacy. And because Bilkstow stood up and challenged her absurd statements, she very confidently singled him out and verbally abused him, called him a weed, and called him an apologist for white supremacy. After all, when you get hired by the United States government to lead DEI training sessions and are given over a million dollars by the Canadian government, what's one white principal standing up and telling you that you're wrong? And perhaps most damning of all, in the series of DEI training sessions, not a single person stood up for a man who has been lauded by the TDSB for his decades of service, for being a champion of equality, merit, and education for all. Nobody said anything, because standing up for their good colleague would mean putting their own lives and careers in danger. This is a cultural revolution that we are in, and Richard Bilkstow's suicide will serve as a cultural flashpoint, not just in Canada, but around the world as well. Drop a like in the video, help us out by subscribing to the True North YouTube channel, stick around for an interview with the journalist that broke these audio tapes, and the common question for the episode is this. What is the end goal for these DEI and anti-racism consultants who seem to take joy in bullying and harassing white people like Richard Bilkstow? Let me know in the comments and let's get into it. In 2015, Richard Bilkstow was described by his supervisor as an experienced, effective, and highly accomplished educational leader. His supervisor went on to say that Bilkstow had proven his excellence in equity, instruction, entrepreneurship, and student engagement. She finished off by describing Bilkstow as a leader among leaders. For 24 years, Richard Bilkstow devoted his life to teaching and educating the youth of Toronto, to champion merit, hard work, academic excellence, and equality of opportunity to make sure that everyone in Toronto had the same shot at success. But you see, somewhere along Richard Bilkstow's 24-year journey in the TDSB, the idea of equality of opportunity gave way to equality of outcome, better known now as equity. And equity is really just a polite way of saying discrimination against white people. But in 2021, after coming out of retirement to take on the position of principal at Burnham Thorpe Public School, Richard Bilkstow was forced to attend a DEI training session led by Kike Ojo Thompson of the Kojo Institute, a woman who has made her career off of finding white supremacy and racism where it doesn't exist and making every white person feel guilty for things they haven't done. Anyway, in these DEI training sessions, which are really just Maoist struggle sessions against white people, Kike Ojo Thompson can be heard telling people things like this. The racism is, is, is we experience it far worse uh, here than there. So um, I know that's gonna be a hard one so people wrap their head around, but that's the level of white supremacy. Like Canada's a bastion of white supremacy and colonialism. And, like they at least had a fighting posture against at least the monarchy. Here we celebrate the monarchy, the very heart and soul and origins of the colonial structure. Think about that, right? And all that it represents. We hold it dear still. Canada is more racist than the United States. K 
Canada is a bastion of white supremacy. It's more racist than the United States because we have the monarchy and we celebrate the monarchy, which I find particularly funny because it's precisely because of the monarchy and the British influence in Canada that led Upper Canada in 1793 to be the first British colony to abolish slavery. Not standing for the outrageous slander of our great country, Bilkstone made what proves to be a fatal mistake. He thought he could stand up to this woman and say that as a matter of fact, she's completely wrong. Well, this is what it sounded like when Richard was the only person in that Zoom call to stand up and speak the obvious. I, I understand when I hear what you're saying, right? However, I think to ignore that fact, right? That we, we talked about here about, you know, capitalism, socialism, we're very happy here. We have a public education system where everyone is funded the same way. It's not like that in the United States. We have a healthcare system here where everyone has access to healthcare. It is not the same way in the United States. So to say, sit here and say all honesty, we're talking about facts and figures and to walk into the classroom tomorrow and say, Canada's just as bad as the United States, I think we're doing an incredible disservice to our learners. Incredible oh. disservice to our learners. And again, yeah, that's what I wanted to, want to say that, right? Thank, thank you so much. But, I, yes. What I'm finding interesting is that in the middle of this COVID disaster, where the inequities in this fair and equal healthcare system have been properly shown to all of us. I mean, so it's just so, and so what's fascinating is and this is why we're in the place that we're in, is that you think, so we're here to talk about anti-black racism, but you and your whiteness think that you can tell me what's really going on for black people. Mm. Like, is that what you're doing? I, I think that's what you're doing, but I'm not sure. So I'm gonna leave you space to tell me what you're doing right now. Exactly, I just wanted to make the point you were talking about the United States. Okay. And I just wanted to do a comparison. And as I said, you talked about facts and figures and, and, and you know, listening to the facts and figures. And I think if everyone here looks at the facts and figures and all kinds of all kinds of studies, and uh, you'll see we're a far more just society. We have we have room for improvement. Absolutely. Are we racist and everything? Is, Absolutely. Great. Right, this is Andrew from Project Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Just look up everything that uh, Keith has been saying. You know, we're not here to compare. You know, we're not here to say this is worse than no. the next one. And not, not, this is just you know, we hear what you're saying. So I, I you know, I hate to disagree with you in this forum, but. Uh, it's just not, not relevant what you bring up. And unfortunately, the experience of Indigenous, Black, and racialized students in the TDSB, probably in whatever school you lead, are just not good enough. And that's just the reality. So yeah. I think if we want to be an apologist for, for the United States or Canada, this is really isn't the forum for that. Now listen to Kike Ojo Thompson in this clip. The following meeting, after previously berating Richard Bilkstow in front of his colleagues, she's laughing to herself and she says she can't believe her luck that someone would resist against the claims that Canada is a bastion of white supremacy. But one of the ways that white supremacy is upheld, protected, reproduced, upkept, um, defended is through resistance. And like I said, as, as I began to speak earlier, we had, I'm, I'm so lucky. <laughs> show up so well last week that we got perfect evidence of an, a wonderful example of resistance that you all got to bear witness to. So we're going to talk about it um, because, I mean, it doesn't get better than this. It's in this moment that Ojo Thompson essentially calls Bilkstow a white supremacist in front of his colleagues. And notice what she says at the very end. It doesn't get better than this. What an astonishing thing to say. Not only did no principals stand up for Bilkstow, other principals on that call joined the pylon. One principal, who's only identified as Lisa, calls Bilkstow the whiteness. Bilkstow would leave Burnham Thorpe and go on sick leave citing workplace harassment. The Workplace Safety and Insurance Board supported Bilkstow's claim of workplace harassment. And the findings for this 2021 Workplace Tribunal about what happened between Bilkstow and Thompson really says all you need to know. Based on the information on file, I am satisfied that the conduct of the speaker was abusive, egregious, and vexatious and rises to the level of workplace harassment and bullying. The WSIB's view was that the DEI trainer intended to cause reputational damage and to make an example out of Bilkstow. You might think that these Maoist struggle sessions that bully, berate, and single out people who dare to stand up 
and defend the truth might be facing more scrutiny now that Richard Bilkstow has taken his life and this story has become international news. But actually, it seems as though the opposite has occurred. Over the weekend, a rally was held in support of Kike Ojo Thompson and the Kojo Institute in Hamilton. And speaking at this rally was an Ontario NDP Member of Parliament, Matthew Green. Listen as he singles out conservative commentators for attacking Kike Ojo Thompson and basically makes Ojo Thompson out to be the victim in this story. Those right-wing media pundits who would seek to weaponize this moment of tragedy against Kike and the Kojo Institute, I have this to say. It is not because of her lack of preparedness or unprofessionalism, no, it is precisely because Kike and the Kojo Institute and every single anti-racist and equity worker that is doing this work is effective in dismantling white supremacy, is effective in addressing anti-blackness in these classrooms and in these public spaces that has this moment of reaction. I want to be clear that every single speaker today could have been Kike, could have been the Kojo Institute, could have been targeted by the violence of white supremacy uh, online and in our communities. Could have been any one of us. So I just want to say in closing, thank you. Thank you not just to Kike and the Kojo Institute and all those who stood in solidarity with her in that moment, know that she is a personification of the struggles that we have, of the progress and the fights that we have won. And in this country, which is a supposed bastion of white supremacy, according to Kike Ojo Thompson, Kike manages to find a way to get over a million dollars in government grants for her critical race theory DEI projects. Aside from running the Kojo Institute, Kike happens to run an organization called the Parents of Black Children. And on the Parents of Black Children website, they proudly present to the world that they have received over a million dollars in government grants. Now, these government grants come from, as far as we can tell, the City of Toronto and the Ontario government, you know, led by that true conservative Doug Ford and that really principled conservative education minister Stephen Lecce. And because we're living in this cultural revolution where anyone who dares to speak up about this absurd nonsense is immediately cancelled and basically blacklisted from their jobs, the TDSB, the Ontario Principals Council, and of course the Ontario Ministry of Education led by that true conservative Stephen Lecce have all recommitted to anti-racism and DEI training. After all, the entire DEI industry itself relies on finding white supremacy and racism where it doesn't exist. Once you and your organization have successfully rooted out systemic racism, organizations like the Kojo Institute and race grifters like Kike Ojo Thompson would be out of work. So of course, no matter how much institutions like the TDSB collectively bend the knee, institute racial quotas and admit to upholding white supremacy, it will always still exist. White supremacy will always be there because women like Kike Ojo Thompson need to make their money somehow. Canada may be in fact the least racist country on earth. I can say that with confidence because in our society we simply don't tolerate racists. But is it actually even true? Because in Canada, white men are routinely excluded from jobs and employers will openly and without hesitation advertise jobs where white men need not apply. In fact, the Ontario Human Rights Commission makes it clear that this practice is in fact totally acceptable. The Ontario Human Rights Code allows special programs to relieve disadvantage or achieve equal opportunity to counter the effects of systemic discrimination. Such programs include measures to remove barriers that discriminate against groups and make sure that disadvantaged groups have the same advantages that others take for granted. According to this National Post article by Jamie Sarkinak in April of 2023, being not white, male, or able-bodied was a requirement for the University of British Columbia's 2022 research chair job postings in food science and quantum computing. Similar requirements were listed for the University of Toronto's positions in management, education, dentistry, engineering, and medicine. Now, this is what equity in practice looks like. Joining us now on the show is the journalist that broke the audio tapes of those interactions between Richard Bilkstow and Kika Ojo Thompson. Rupa Subramania, one of my colleagues here at True North, also the host of the Rupa Subramania show. Rupa, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, thanks, Harrison. It's great to be on your show. So you released the audio tapes of these interactions. As I said in the show, 
they're just as gross and disgusting as I think anyone imagined them to be. You clearly hear Kike uh, just berating Richard Bilkstow, singling him out because he dared to say that Canada was in fact not as racist as the United States. It just goes, it just gets worse from there. But the fallout of this story I find to be more interesting. You now have politicians in Canada rallying to Kike Ojo Thompson's defense, to the Kojo Institute's defense. They're holding speeches and doing rallies, shamelessly defending her and, and making Kike Ojo Thompson the victim of the story. The victim of the story, not, not of course being Richard Bilks or the man who took his life. What do you make of this defense of Kike and the Kojo Institute and really the DEI industry? Yeah, uh, thanks, Harrison. So my story for the free press, uh, which uh, includes the uh, audio recordings, which I was uh, able to obtain uh, uh, big chunks of the audio recordings of the DEI session um, 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 that Richard uh, Bilkstow attended, where he was bullied and, uh, and smeared as a white supremacist. Uh, makes for uh, uh, you know it's it's very difficult to listen to it. It, it it's very painful. You can see just how horrific the whole thing was, and how you know what he must have been going through when you had this person um, uh, you know bullying him and laughing uh, uh, you know as she's bullying him, and then you had his colleagues mercilessly pile on him, um, and 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 it was you know you, it just makes you realize just just you know just how devastated he must have felt how let down he must have felt so uh i'm not entirely surprised at the fact that you have uh politicians um uh, like the this ndp politician matthew green i believe that's whom you're referring to mm -hmm. i'm not at all surprised that uh that you know people like that are uh, rallying in defense of uh, ojo thompson um uh, because that's that's their ideology that's what they're going to defend they're they're not going to um you know this is this is for them it's as richard um uh said a, in an interview with the free press before he uh he died this was a few months ago um he um he said you know these school boards uh it's uh, or at least at the tdsp it's not it's not about uh, competence in, anymore it's all about the ideology and i think that um that uh, that would ap that applies to the political establishment as well especially with uh, with the ndp uh so i'm not at all surprised that they're coming in support of her because um if if, if they didn't i mean that would uh, i mean i i would have i would have you know i would have liked to have seen them do something different but this was fully expected as far as i i'm concerned right and and in those audio recordings, as you point out, it's not just that the principles, the other 199 principles at that meeting are silent. In fact, as you point out, some of them are piling on to Richard. This man was lauded by the TDSB for his decades of service to the school board, for being a, ch a champion of equality and fairness in schools. And the moment that Kike singles him out, everyone else stays silent. And in fact, even worse, they start to pile on. I noticed a tweet you put out, Rupa. I think it was just a few days ago after this story came out. And you had put out a call to any of the other 200 school principals that were in these meetings to speak anonymously to you about this. And you point out that not a single person has come forward. People are afraid to show a, to defend this man who was completely berated and bullied in front of all of his peers. Why do you think there's this culture of fear that that surrounds the DEI industry? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a very um, important question, and the answer to that uh, is, you know, has many layers. It's 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 complicated. So you have um, a culture of compliance and political correctness in Canada, which uh, predates all of this stuff. Um, all of the DEI and the culture wars and wokeism, it, it, it goes even before that. And then, uh, and so the environment, in my opinion, uh, was just ripe for all of these things to take root. Um, uh, cultural Marxism and um, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, critical race theory, 
all of that stuff, actually, I think uh, Canada was just uh, primed for that. It was just it was just there. You know, the environment was there for for these things to take root. And um, and 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 so I think you have a set of people who truly believe in this. They truly you have uh, white people who truly are ashamed of the fact that they're white. Um, they they are very um, you know they I think they're ashamed of who they are. Uh, look, I mean, no one's denying that you know colonialism is bad, and you know things that happened under colonialism were bad. And you know, most sensible people would agree that you know what happened in the past was 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 you know is not something that we would support today. But as I've argued in many, many um, uh, places, uh, including on a debate that I was part of, uh, the Monk debates about two years ago, the Canada of today is not the Canada of 1867. We've made a lot of progress since then, and we're not we're not the same country. Uh, we made a lot of gains towards uh, inclusion and that sort of thing, and that's one reason why I chose to come to Canada all those years ago because I because you know I, I I thought this country was different from every other country so uh the the fact is that um that uh you know there is a culture of fear but there's a culture of fear everywhere uh in you know all over the world but there's something that's unique I believe that's happening here, it's unique to Canada. I think it's a culture of cowardice. I think that's what I said a few days ago. Uh, I'm just tired of the excuse of the culture of fear because you know we're all fearful of uh, losing our jobs of, you know, I'm fearful of, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that, you know, I may one day stop writing. You know, we all have our fears. We all have bills to pay. We all have um, uh, things that we depend on. Nobody wants uh, that to be taken away from us. Uh, no one wants that to be taken away, but, but here you have educators, teachers, school principals, vice principals, they're partly in charge of shaping young minds. They're supposed to be cultivating um, um, uh, critical thinking in in young people. They're supposed to be telling young people to be not uh, to, to not be fearful, to stand up for what is right. And yet, these very same people uh, presided over the bullying um, of, of of a man who is just politely and gently pushing against a claim um, that Canada is not a bastion of white supremacy. And they all either stood by and just watched or uh, and applauded and 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 piled on him. And that's what's incredibly shocking and disturbing because these these are people who are educating uh, uh, you know our kids today um and, and so it's 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 quite worrying and it's a culture of cowardice not a single right. person has come forward even to this day even anonymously saying rupa you know i was there at this session all i was really looking for at that point when i sent my tweet more than a week ago was look can you corroborate what happened in the session i'd already listened to the recordings at this point so you know this was just another check um just just you know just tell me you know what happened is this what happened what 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 was that like so no one, no one came forward and uh it's it's just shameful i mean and i think people should uh, should realize just how brave and courageous um, these people really are in the wor real world. They're quite happy to pile right. on an innocent man in a Zoom session, but uh, they're just cowardly when it comes to actually defending themselves or to be held uh, held to account for uh, what they were part of. Yeah, and, and what do you make of this? So Kike calls Canada a bastion of white supremacy. Uh, it seems to me, Rupa, that there does happen, there does seem to be a double standard. In that meeting, you heard that his colleagues were referring to referring to him as the whiteness, and that Kike referred to him as a weed, that, that, that the weed whacker needed to come out and put him down. And the reality is that you won't you won't find any job posting in this country that explicitly excludes, say, black men or Chinese men from applying. But there are such cases as job postings at universities and other places and other institutions that explicitly exclude white men from being hired. And even the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal has a has a, a disclaimer underneath systemic discrimination that explicitly allows special programs to relieve disadvantage or achieve equal opportunity to counter the effects of systemic discrimination. So it doesn't seem to be that Canada is this bastion of white supremacy, obviously, but it does seem to be that in the institutions, not hiring white men is allowed. I mean, what, what kind of white supremacist country is this? 
Yeah, I mean, it's the, you know, this is again, um, revisiting these points that I made up a couple of years ago in this debate that I mentioned, the monk debates, and this is precisely what I was saying, that uh, this is a country that has gone to great lengths to include people uh, in the, in the um, in, you know, in, 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 the, in its institutions. Um, the leader of, uh, 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 you know, the NDP is a South Asian man. Uh, uh, of South Asian descent, um, uh, leading talking heads on TV and elsewhere are, uh, you know, you can see the diversity, um, you know, uh, there's, there's no escaping that. Um, and, you know, so, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure where this is coming from, you know, why they insist that Canada is a bastion of white supremacy. It, it's, it's, it's meant to uh, shock you. It's meant to be um, it's it's meant to rile people up, I suppose. Um, it's not based in fact, uh, and that's what Richard Bilkstow was uh, trying to uh, say in that um, when he when he stood up and spoke, and he said, "Look, these are the facts. We have a public health uh, healthcare system that's accessible to everybody. We have a public education system that's accessible to everybody, and that's that's a fair point. That absolutely is. If in our system, if we all have access to the same thing, but the outcomes, which is what Kiki Oja Thompson was referring to, that the outcomes are different for kids growing up in Jane and Finch neighborhood versus the kids of Forest Hill. The outcomes could be different for a range of different reasons. It's not because of white supremacy. Right. You know, it could be, um, you know, you grew up, grow up in a poor household. You know, you, you have parents who are not there at home. You know, you're left to your own devices. Um, and your, uh, you know, it could be a range of different factors, but to blame it all on white supremacy, as Kiki Oja Thompson does, is just absolutely ridiculous. And it, she should be laughed out of court for saying something like that. Um, uh, you know, here I am as a person of color, uh, you know, hosting a podcast on uh, uh, for True North, and I, a, you know, and I, I've written for the National Post and the pages of the National Post. Um, maybe I should thank white supremacy for allowing me these opportunities because, you know, I, I, I mean, only in Canada would this kind of thing be possible or may, and even in the U S but, but, you know, I cannot imagine this happening anywhere else on the planet. So, uh, so the fact that, you know, I've had these opportunities, um, you know, I, I'm not sitting here and saying it's, 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 you know, it's just outrageous. That's all I can say. Yeah. Well, you know, Ruba, a, a good man for standing up for his country, for standing up for the truth, and for standing up for everyone in that room. He was pushed to the breaking point, a tragic story. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, Ruba. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone, that's going to do it for us today on the show. Thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Harrison Faulkner, and this is Ratio.